This week on Merchants of Change, we've got Keenan, one name, and if you know, you know. Keenan is also born and raised in Massachusetts and grew up as an athlete. He's written two books, Not Taught, and a bestseller on modern sales called Gap Selling, a must have for those who wanna bring their sales career to the next level and truly understand their customer's world. Today, Keenan is the CEO of a sales growth company, a leader in revenue generating solutions for B2B companies, and the CEO of Noted Analytics, a sales coaching software. Here he is, Keenan. I'm JR Butler, co founder and CEO of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes and military veterans into becoming a professional salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. Dude, we, let's let's jump right into it. So, uh, so Keenan, our our audience, uh, like I kind of mentioned to you before the show, we help folks that play college sports, professional sports, and Olympic sports, as well as military veterans uh, break into sales careers. Um, our audience that listens are really new sellers, people that are first time in sales. Um, what we like to do when we, when we bring a guest on is, is talk a little bit about your background, talk about how you found sales, you know, the transition um, that you had getting into the business. Um, and then just talk about your career and some lessons learned. I'm really excited personally to um, to expose our audience to gap selling. I'm I'm in the middle of your book right now. Um, it's been it's been phenomenal. A lot of thanks, sir. Yeah, a lot of parallels between what we're teaching um, and definitely learning. I'm actually learning a lot in the process. Um, so I know I know you didn't play sports at the college level, but from looking at your background, it looks like you're a a, a really good skier. Um, I, I know that you went to high school in, in Cape Cod. How did you land in skiing, dude? I mean, uh, New Hampshire is just a few hours away. I mean, I, I lived in Boston for a while and, and, um, grew up in Medford and Wakefield. So, I mean, what, okay. I mean, New Hampshire is only, even from the Cape, it's only what, three, three and a half hours or something. I mean, it's like anything else. So, uh, and I played football for, from what, I don't know, third grade or fourth grade, all the way up to the end of high school. Um, I played basketball one year at a junior college. I played basketball there. Um, I ran track for years. I went to boarding school for a while in Vermont. Yeah, I went to boarding school in Vermont for a while. So I skewed I was there and I played football when I was up there at St. Johnsbury Academy. So um, I just got on it and loved it. And so I just did on the side. And then when I was done with, you know, call it, well, for the first two years of college, I was like, what am I going to do? I'm like, well, fuck it. I'm going to go ski. So I moved to Vail and became a ski bum. That's awesome. Is, is, was skiing a huge reason why you went to college out in Colorado? No, it was the other way around. So I did two years at a junior college, uh, Mount Ida and yep. Newton. Same place yep. as Gary V. It's just funny. I'm 10 years older than him, although he looks older than me. It's all I'm going to say. Sorry, Gary, but you do. Um, and uh, um, so when I was done with that, I was like, well, what am I going to do? I'm 21. Uh, you know, I got nowhere to go. And I really, I knew I didn't want to start a career. I knew that. So I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll go ski and I'll be a ski bum. And I was supposed to go to Killington. And then I met this dude. Uh, couldn't tell you who he was. He was older. So he was probably in his mid thirties. But when you're 21, that's an old dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he, when I told him I was going to Killington, he laughed at me. He's like, what are you doing Killington? I'm like, what are you kidding? It's the best mountain in the East coast. He goes, exactly. The East coast. The best skiing in the world is in Colorado or Utah. Why you would go up to fucking Killington is beyond me, but you're a knucklehead. And of course, being an obstinate kid, I was like, whatever, man, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. And then I don't know, man, week later, two weeks later, it really doesn't matter. Front cover of, of Ski Magazine, Vail, number one ski resort in North America. And I was like, oh, that guy might be onto something. So... I changed all my plans, moved to Vail. It was only supposed to be for a summer. Well, then that summer, I mean, I mean, sorry, 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 sorry. It was only supposed to be for a winter, right? Just one winter, go and be a ski bum. Well, then that summer came, and that time I met these girls who lived in Boulder. And this is 1989. I'm a little older than most of y'all, but 1989, 90, it's 90 now, first year of 90. 
And they're like, oh, you got to come to Boulder. And I was like, okay. So I went to Boulder. And this was the year that Boulder was playing for the national championship against um, against uh, uh, Notre Dame. And this was, you know, this was the time of, of um, uh, you wouldn't know any of these players, but, you know, Oh, uh, doesn't matter. Oh, Eric Bieniemy. If you follow the, if, yeah. yeah, Eric Bieniemy played for us then, and Canavis McGee and Alfred Wiz. Like they were the, one of the best teams ever. So I go to Boulder and I go into this bar. And sorry, but I, you know I'm 21. I had never seen so many hot chicks in my entire life. I was like, oh my god, this town's incredible. And so they were like, we need a roommate this summer. So like, oh, I'm in. So I became, you know, I moved to Boulder from Bale. I became their roommate, and then I was going to go home after that. And then someone said to me, well, why are you going home, right? And I'm like, I got to go. I got to look. I'm 22 now. Like, I got to get my shit together. I got to go back and finish college. I only got two years. And like, why don't you just go here? You have in-state tuition. And I'm like, what's in-state tuition? Because, dude, you get it. From Massachusetts, state schools suck, okay? I'm sorry, UMass, but state schools suck in Massachusetts. You go to, like, you go to Harvard, MIT, BC, BU, you know, um, uh, Bentley, Bo- not not uh, not Bo- Bentley. Like we got good private schools in Massachusetts, but you don't have good public schools, right? Like you, no one's beating the door down a Fitchburg State and shit. So when they told me that I could go to the University of Colorado at that time for like five thousand dollars a semester, or I could try and go back to BC and try to get into BC at like twenty thousand a semester back then, I was no fucking brainer. So I stayed to go back to school, and now you can figure it out. Now, now I've been there like five years. I'm out of school. I'm 24, 25. Fuck it. I'm here, and I stayed. I love it. I love it. Now, now obviously, at some point, the this, this ski bum dream came to an end. Was, was the plan always eventually sales because, like, conversations you had? Like, how did that, how did that transition from ski bum to sales? How did that look? Um, luck. Luck. And, and – you know, it's really funny. I, oof, wow. People say, that's, no one's ever asked me that question before. And oddly enough, I've never given it thought. Um, I always knew that I wanted to get into business. But I, 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 I was never real deliberate in my life. I just, I just went with what felt good. So I went to Colorado. Then I went to Boulder. Then I got my education. And then when I was done with that, oh, at the time when I was a little better looking and had more hair, blah, 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 I was, a mo- I was modeling in, in, in Denver and I was getting some decent gigs, but modeling is similar to major league baseball is the only way to describe it. So Denver's like double is like a ball, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe double yeah. a ball. And then you go to yeah. South Beach, Miami and that's like triple a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then New York and, and Oh, LA is like LA's no Denver's triple uh, a ball. LA is like double a Miami is AAA and then New York and Milan and Paris. That's like the majors, right? And so a lot of people, you kind of, most people got to work their way up when you move from different cities. So I moved to South Beach, Miami to get on with an agency there and quote unquote AAA and hopefully get good and work on my book is what you do. Your your book is just back in those days. It wasn't digital. The better your book is, the more more gigs you get, the more gigs you bet, more people to see you. And then you get better agencies. You literally work your way up. So short of the story is I went to, to South Beach to do that. And I was down there for about a month or so. And I was having a modicum of luck, but not super luck. And a buddy called me up and he goes, dude, I got a job for you. Time, I was 27 or 26, 27. He says, time to fucking get real. And I was like, I don't know, man. I'm having kind of a good time out here, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, it pays about $60,000 a year. Now back in 1994 or five, I was calculating thousand dollars a week <laughs> or twelve hundred dollars a week oh let's go and then i started saying well i had this dream to to at least make modeling for a while and dude the, you asked interesting questions this literally went through my mind at the time i was just on the on the edge that i i was i knew some of the other bigger models and one of my friends was who's still a friend today was modeling with tyson beckford many of you are probably too young to remember tyson but tyson that at the time was basically the supermodel of men. And there was only one. Women have like 20 supermodels, like everybody knows. But with men, there's like one or two. And then you got a bunch of guys underneath. So I did the math and I said, even if Tyson is making a million bucks a year, which in those days he probably wasn't, but he might do it two, three, four, five, six more years, but then he's done. And then what? So I said, I'm probably not gonna get to Tyson. So if I get to the big leagues, I might be making 300,000 a year, maybe 400 for three, four, five, six years, but then it's fading out. And then what? 
But if I go into business in three, four, five years, I might be able to get to 300K myself and it doesn't go away. It just keeps keep. So I did this, like, you know, inversion thing. And I was like, fuck it. I'm out. Modeling's done. Thanks, everybody. So <laughs> the job that my friend got me was a sales job. It was literally a sales job. I had to sell chamber memberships for the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And I was there one year. I, I broke every record they'd ever had. I made like $75,000 that year. I thought I was rolling in it. And I, and everybody's like, oh my God, you're an amazing salesperson. So I never look back. Dude, 60K in 1994 is like $130,000. You're making $130,000 to sell chamber memberships? That's ridiculous. Yeah, I never, I, yeah, yeah, I guess so. I Really, is that, is that am I that old that now 60,000 is the equivalent to 130? Fuck, that sucks. I mean, wow, I'm old as dirt. That's yeah, yeah. That's what I did. Uh -huh. And already for okay. this, only fifteen thousand in it was guaranteed. That's all you got. Got it. That got was it. your base, okay. fifteen thousand. I had to do the rest. So like sixty was like whatever OTE was considered yep. at that time. Yeah, and I blew uh, past OTE. Pew. That so you don't hear that. Like I, I'll be honest with you, Keenan. I, I I got into I tripped and fell into sales. Everybody does. That's why I started my company because we want to bring people into this profession with intention. Um, but I'll be honest, like I, I, I've always been able to talk a dog off a meat wagon, but selling like business to business did not come naturally to me, like the business acumen side and shit like that. What made you, what do you think made you like so natural at it right from the jump? This is conjecture speculation. Um, my manager at the time asked a question that might add insight to it. I think I just naturally understood that it wasn't about me, it was about them. Now, if you had asked me at the time, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question. But oh. I think at the time, I naturally, unconsciously understood it was about them and not about me. Because I had been selling for maybe four or five months in my, and remember, I had never sold a day in my life. And so this manager thought I was going to be a project. And within like 30 days, he's like, this dude's killing it. He, he said, who taught you how to consult to sell? And I go, what the fuck is consultative selling? Like I had no, like I had no idea what he was talking about. And then he explained it to me. And I don't know what my answer is, but I'm going to make it up. Looking back, I think I said something like, well, I don't know. I mean, they're buying for me. I got to give them a reason to buy, right? I, I uh oh, you froze. Oh no, yeah. I got to give them a reason to buy. I, 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 I got to understand what they get out of it, not what do I get out of it. So that's the foundation I started with. Dude, that, I mean, that's a, that's a fucking wild epiphany to have at that age and that early in your career. Most people, they have to learn the hard way that it's not about pitching products and like pressuring people. It's about understanding what they need. That's, that's like, dude, that's like picking up a golf, a golf club and hitting a 75 for the first time. That's ridiculous. Well, look, don't get me wrong. Like I'm you, taking your metaphor. I'm sure my swing looked like shit, you know, cause I do remember I do remember pitching and I do remember like, you know, but what I, what I did in that process is I, I, I recall stopping if I was getting resistance and being like, well, what are you doing now? Or, you know, how are you marketing now? Cause it was all about connections and marketing and, and, and what, what is your growth strategy now? So I remember if I was getting resistance, or something, like I said, I'm sure my swim was ugly as fuck, but I, I remember that rather than cram more features down, I'd be like, wait a minute, man. Like, how are you doing this? And how are you doing that? And when they couldn't answer it well, I'd be like, well, that's why we're here. So if you don't have this, or you can't make this happen, this may make sense. And so I, I remember people like, oh, they'd be like, oh, and then and it would shift to, to you know, them seeing the, the value to them. And then, and then you went from like the chamber selling role. That's when you got into the, the tech side, right? Is that, was that the next step? So I sold, uh, the memberships of the chamber went from like, Again, this is back in 1990. It would have been 95 or 96, I guess. Maybe 90. We'll go with 96. 95, 96. I, 94 is probably too early, but it was. we'll say 95, 96. doesn't matter. Um, it was the $175 was the cheapest one to $10,000. Well, I only sold one $10,000 membership the entire time I was there, but – not, I think only one other rep or two other reps had ever sold. Like that was like, you sold one of those, you were the master, right? So I sold one of those, but then to this company, I sold a $2,500 one. And they were a big IT consulting firm that was building a branch in Denver. And so they wanted to join the chamber as part of whatever. And I convinced, rather than just getting one of the cheap ones, I had 
sold them into a $2,500 one. And that company was so impressed at how I sold them that I, it's a longer story if I'm going to tell you, I can tell you, but I was able to convince them after only working at the chamber for one year to hire me as a salesperson. Now I have a base of $45,000. So I was all excited about that. And then a OT of like 120 or something like that. And this is yep. now, this is 1997. I started there in 1997. Yep. Yep. Um, Funny enough, I, that's how I started. I started my career in an IT consulting company, selling back in the day EMC and VMware and Cisco and shit yeah. like that. Um, I, I actually think, you know, I, I tell people all the time, going to like a reseller or like a consultancy is a really good way to learn how to sell versus going to like a product company because you can't go in there with a hammer and seeing everything as a nail. You need to figure out like what the hell the problem is before you start talking about the 50 products that are on your, on your conveyor belt. You know what I mean? Great point. Um, Great point. I like that. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I noticed you, you, you went down, you, you did it. You had a lot of different kind of stops along the way, you know, ICG, you went to ICG after that one and then Entrato and, and create buzz and then Avaya. But then, then you got into the, into the author business. How did, how did that happen? Keenan? Well, the author business didn't happen until, I, look, I wrote Get, well, I guess I did write Not Taught is up there still. Yeah, little Not Taught. Yeah. This is the greatest book no one's ever heard of. I actually like this book better than Gap Selling. Really? Just know I said it. Because it's going to have a greater impact in everybody's life. Like it is, it's what, it's going to blow people's minds, especially when I wrote it in 2015 or whatever, 16. Um, but the, the real, the real story in the, I'll give you the streamline. You want more, you can ask. The real story is I, um, I, I went from modeling in the, in the streets, <laughs> modeling in South Beach, Miami, in I guess it would have been 95, yep. to selling chamber memberships in 96, to selling um, and making $65,000 a year, to making 125000 $130,000 at born information services from 1997 to 2000 then to running ICG's managed modem business with 130 people reporting to me and 300 million dollars in revenue attached to that and oh by the way managed modem is before you had um uh high speed you had yeah. dial up we sold the ports so oh, so wow. you had to so, there were so many ports you could have per user so if you I'm making the shit up if you had 2 million users you had to have 200,000, basically numbers that people could dial to dial into the internet. So anyways, then, so I did all that in three years. Okay. So then they went under because broadband came out, right? No one was buying ports anymore. So when I went to get my next job, I remember this guy looking at me, he's like, this don't make no sense. Like that's, you're, you're only 32 years old. I think I was 32. And he's like, now, now, this isn't making sense. So it took me forever to find a job, almost went broke, and I had to take a slight step back, right? And so I remember thinking, I don't like this. I don't want, so I worked at Entrado for a long time, did really well there, went to get my next job, same thing happened. I wasn't getting, I was having a hard time breaking through because my career was so short, and in those days, it was all resumes. There was no LinkedIn, there was really no social media, so you only had, so they'd see 33 year old guy, 300 million in revenue, only three years work history, 45, 50 year old guy or woman, but usually guys back then, um, you know, same thing, but doing it forever. No brainer going with them. I just wasn't. So I was like, fuck this. So my idea was in 2009, after taking six months to a year, every time I wanted to find a new job, I started blogging. And the logic was, if I can build an audience of 1,000, 1,500 people, that's all. I, it was pretty naive that if I ever needed a job again, all I had to do was write on the blog and say, hey, you know, y'all have been following me. You know what I'm all about. I'm looking for a new gig. And the, I thought, hey, someone would reach. Like, it would be much easier. That was the thought. Like, so I looked at blogging as like an ongoing job interview. So I blogged every single day for two years. And next thing I know, I'm getting 20,000 followers and people are writing you know, listing me as top sales influencer or on the list or top sales blog. And I'm getting all this attention and come please speak at our shit. And I didn't see any of that coming. So after two years of blogging every single day for 725 days or whatever is 356, 712 days, um, 
I got let go because we got purchased by a company out of England, my last job. And I remember thinking, okay, I got six months. I can take six months to a year to find a new job at the level that I want to stay at without going backwards. Or, fuck it, maybe I'll try to turn this blog into a consulting business because people have been calling me up and saying, hey, do you do consulting? Do you help? And I kept saying no because I had a real job. So I called one of those people and said, hey, you still need that help? They said, yes. I threw out a number and they were like, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm like, oh, two of these, I can live. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you get me two of these. At that time, I was only charging 7500 a month. I get two of these, 15 k a month, no overhead. no Like, I can learn to live on that for now, right? So – that's kind of how it went down. And then it just, and then I just built and built and built. And then after seven years, that's when I wrote the book. And, and not taught is, is it, is it, do you consider, you said it changed people's lives. Do you consider that a sales book or is that like a personal growth book? Like what? It's what, a life book. Life book. Yes. It's a, it's a life success book. It's the simple premise is I basically say that the world has changed from the 20th century to the 21st century. And that, success has changed with it. How you become successful changes with it. And you can't apply the 20th century rules to your career development and personal development in the 21st century. So I have chapters like building a brand. Do I actually have a, which I have a Building a brand. You were, you were ahead of the curve, dude. Oh yeah. So I, in, in, in 2015, I talked about the importance of reach and why reach will be your greatest asset in the 21st century. I talked about building the brand you I talked about the importance of creating your own content. I talked about the importance of creating change. Then I talked about the importance of taking risks, what I call have the balls to make it happen. Then I talked about the importance of thinking. I basically said that information's coming at us so fast that unlike the old days when management held all the, the, the um, information and data and told you what they need to know and you just did what they told you, I said, now they can't control it. And so they're looking for people who can take the information out and tell them what they you think we should do. And that, so now thinkers are going to be the winners in the future. So I talked about that. I talked about the importance of selling. I said, screw your degree. I said, stop leaning on that. That's not going to help you anymore. I talked about the difference between experience versus expertise. And that again, in a world where information is infinitely available to us, those people that think their value is based on how many years they've been punching the clock versus how much they actually know about their space and their their profession uh, is going to win. So I said, focus more on ex expertise and experience. I talked about the value of results versus time. Again, back in the day, you were paid for your time. People don't give a fuck about your time anymore. I don't care if you were here for, you know, you put in 82 hours this month. Did you get done what you're supposed to get done? And if you didn't, fuck you and get out. Right. So I just I just break down all of those different things and how they matter in today's world. That I mean, experience versus expertise is is fucking gold, dude. That is gold um, that I mean, you, you got a new customer on that book, Keenan. I'm buying that thing. That sounds unbelievable. You kind of um, you kind of tripped and fell into entrepreneurship the same way you tripped and fell into sales. Um, yeah. yeah, you're right. You know well, what I mean? Okay. Out of fairness, out of fairness, I love how you do this. You ask good questions. This is one of the better podcasts I've done. Everybody is so droit. You're actually doing a good job. Um, Thank you. So it's funny. I like to say I tripped into a successful one. I had already yeah. started three businesses earlier than that. All three failed. I had these great ideas and it was going to revolutionize and they all fucked up. But this one is just an, another one of a whole bunch, but I just did it better than everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are those are, those are failures, but they're as you know, they're learning opportunities. You have to look at them yeah. like that as a salesperson. Um, the the generation we're working with, Keenan, right? Gen Z is so different than any generation before it, and they have, in my opinion, they have entrepreneurship more in their bones than anybody. And 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 when we see what we see in the ath the athletic space is these kids are making money with their brand, name, image, likeness, and they come out of school and they want to keep being an entrepreneur. And our whole message is like, listen, being an entrepreneur is awesome. Working for yourself is awesome. I do it. I earned it through a lot of experience, not expertise, but experience mm -hmm. to your point. Mm -hmm. But my, our message is like, listen, the first, the first rule of entrepreneurship is the ability to sell, right? So talk to me a little bit about how your sales background has helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, that was a question for me? Yeah. Oh, um, 
I, I think it was. It, uh, hmm. Yeah, I get. Uh, I don't think you're gonna like my answer because. Okay. okay. Yeah. Truth, I, I, look, I think. Is what I want. Okay, so when I first started, it, I was selling me. Okay, so I didn't have a team of people. I didn't have gaps selling the book. So I, I, I you know, I was a consultant of one. Mm -hmm. um, and so selling had a huge job to do with it. But the large majority of the selling, and I'm leaning more and more in this from a B2B perspective as well. And some companies are embracing it, but others aren't. And, but the majority of my selling was done in the first seven years of the consulting company because of the marketing that I did. So it was, it was all about my content. And right, wrong, or in, on different JR, I felt, and I guess I got lucky here, that if I had to actually prospect, I was undermining my authority. So if I was a sales guru, if you will, I like to pretend that I was, and I was super smart, calling up people and trying to prospect that way was actually the worst thing I could do. Like, I was like, hey, I'm Keenan. I'm a consultant. I want to work. I just like, I'm, I'm going to lose all credibility. I'm going to lose all frame. I, I just, I, I just thought it was dumb. So knowing that right, wrong or indifferent, I was like, how do I get people to buy into me without doing that? So that's where the content came in, right? So I started creating content in 2009. Then after I went solo, I then kept creating that content. I went to, um, conferences, man, this is all pre-COVID. I went to conferences. I offered to speak at conferences for free. I, uh, I created a resource library. So I was using HubSpot in 2012, right? And I had a whole resource library leveraging HubSpot. I remember I'd go to uh, one, well, probably not once a week, but it feels like that. Once a week or once a month, I would go to Starbucks for two or three days and sit there and I'd create another ebook so that I'd get all these people downloading my eBooks. So by doing this and continually doing this, Every single deal I got for eight years before I wrote the book was inbound. Every one. Every single one. So I am really bullish on inbound. My daughter's looking at starting a, a company. She's only 16. She's kind of tall, 5'10, but she's got long legs. I'm 6'2, and her legs are as tall as mine, right? So she's all legs. So it's about a 34 inseam. She can't find anything from a from a, a sweatpants perspective that fit her, right, in the legs. So she's starting this business. Look, she's not trying to make millions. She just wants to make a little money and see what happens. But my point is, she's not going to make any money by calling people up. It's all going to be content. It's all going to be marketing. It's all going to be that. So the answer to your question is, depending on what they're trying to sell, I would argue that it's more about marketing, content, and reach than it is about selling. I agree. Let me, can I play devil's advocate for a yeah. second? Though? Yeah. Because I think, and I think you'll agree with me, but I think the reason that your content worked from 2009 and, and still does to this day is because you are not pitching in your content. You are understanding the audience and the problems that they have, and you're solving that with your content. And that's... yeah. That's selling, right? Okay, then yes. If that's that definition of selling, then yes, 100%. I agree with you, hands down. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to be honest, like that's the pro that that is, we talk about how sales is broken all the time. We're on the same page about too many people focused on the top of the funnel and not thinking about what they're doing with people that have raised their hand and started working with them. I think one of the reasons that the top of funnel is, is broken is because marketers don't think like salespeople. They think like marketers and they're, and they're puking all over the audience with their content, yep. with features and benefits instead of thinking about the problems. Right. Yep. I love it. I love it. Um, now how was, how was gap selling born Keenan? Like where, where, where did it, was it always in the back of your head? You were going to bring this thing to market. Like where did that, where was that, where was that seed planted? Um, I decided around 2017 that I wanted to write a book. Uh, I had looked at a bunch of content I had already created um, and some other things and like, oh, there it is right there, the gap. No one's talking about the gap. And and that happened because I was I was working with a client. It's kind of a funny story. I was working with a client and they had their best sales rep. His name was Robert. 
And Robert produced, but he got on my nerves because every time we do a deal review or something, he, he was never like a typical successful salesperson, never prepared, never had their information. So I started making and prepare. And the long and the short of it is I would get to a deal and I'd say, okay, what problem do they have? Why should they buy? And he would say, oh, they have disparate systems. And at first I accepted it. Okay, disparate systems. So that's what you buy. And then I realized that about six or seven or eight opportunities in, the next one I said, so why does this company have to buy? So, oh, they have disparate systems. And then I was like, wait a minute. That's the last, this now, stop, 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 stop. They can, it's, disparate systems is not a problem. I remember that like, that's not a problem. What's yeah. the actual problem? He goes, it's disparate systems. And I'm like, no. And I said, let me walk you through this. And I went up to the board and I had no idea how it came to me. But I said, look, motherfucker, this starts, if someone has a problem today and they have this problem and they want to fix it and it probably wasn't this eloquent and it's causing them problems and they want to get over here and this is what they want to happen. And the space in between is this gap. And the bigger this gap is, that's when you know you have something to sell. So disparate systems is not a problem. What's the problem? And I remember thinking when I sat down, I don't even know what he said. I sat down, I looked on the board, I'm like, ooh, that's pretty good. So I took a picture of it. And it probably sat there for two or three years in my head. And I, I don't know how it came up, but somewhere along the line, I was like, ooh, this is what it's about. And so then as I had to show how do you get the gap and I had to define the gap more. And as I flushed all of that out, it became more and more clear I was onto something. And then I said, oh, I can write a book on this. That's amazing. Um, and, and like at the core, like if you were going to describe gap selling at the core, I, I think you did a, just did a pretty good job, but pretend the audience has never sold anything before. How would you explain that to somebody that's a novice in sales? First time coming into the, into the industry, they want, they want to get the right skills, the right habits. They want to understand the right processes. Where does this fit in? And like, what does that look like to that novice seller? I mean, I, all I would tell you is that selling isn't about selling or telling or trying to convince people to buy something. That selling is about actually helping somebody change. That's your job as a salesperson, help somebody change. Well, you can't help somebody change if you don't know what's broken and why they need to change and what they expect to get what, you, what they expect to be different in their world. So gap selling simply basically operates from the psychology of change that says, okay, where are you now? What's the problem? Like, what's the problem with what's going on now? Why is that a problem? What's causing that problem? And therefore, if we solve it, what do you hope to get by solving it? And how would you define that? And how far away are you from that now? That's the gap. The bigger the gap, the greater value there is in that in that effort and the more they'll pay this and the more they'll be inclined to change the smaller the gap the less the pay and the less they'll be inclined to change so that's really what gap selling is all about is helping you understand how do i help somebody change yeah yeah do you, do you know by the way Keenan, I, and, and i feel bad putting you on the spot do you know what the name of this podcast is or no oh yeah this change something hold on Mer yeah Mer Mer merchants of change yes yes <laughs> merchants of change there you go i like that yes 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 I had one of my, one of my mentors had a big merchant to change uh, thing behind his desk. And that's what he used to tell us. He's like, Hey, you're here to help people change what they're doing today into a better world. That's, that's, that's perfect. That, and, and by the way, like the, we always, the, the original logo we had was going to be a caveman rolling away a wheel out because that yep. was the first that was the first merchant of change. He needed to, somebody needed to explain to other people why a wheel made sense for them. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. No, I, look, I am not an anthropologist, but I get it. Probably wheel was the same. Yeah, I get a wheel probably came first. Cause I was thinking they changed from bra from stone to bronze, bronze to steel, right? Like, so which one? Yeah, I'll go with the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. The wheel, the wheels fir first tech salesperson was a caveman. Um, the, uh, so here's a good question. You, I agree with everything you just said, by the way. And, and obviously that's what we preach the name of our podcast. How important do you think that mindset is when you're, when you're sitting in the seat for the first time as a salesperson, like you, do you call it a methodology? Do you call it a, a deal management process? I don't know. Like, I think, I know you guys have tools that help with deal management and, and it's, and you know, I know you don't like the idea of a methodology, but like, how important is that stuff when you're like, you're first learning how to pick up the phone and dial, dial, uh, dial out to get a meeting? Like, where does this fall into the career journey, in your opinion? What's the this? The idea, what you just described gap selling as like, mm -hmm. like, 
It's How everything. Cool. Yeah. It's How everything. Cool. Right. It's absolutely everything. Look, everything after that is execution, right? Everything after that premise is execution. And I think we did a pretty good job with the execution piece, but the, the, the mindset, or the, it's, it's critical. It's everything. And here's why. You don't get to tell people what value is. But so many people ask, oh, what's your value proposition? I don't know what my value proposition is because I don't get to decide. I know where we may be able to bring value. Or we, I, better yet, let me say this. I know where you may find value in us, and it's in these areas. We solve these problems, so I believe by solving these problems, you may find value in us. But no, we don't get to decide value. So what people understand is if you want to be rich, figure out a way to find value. I'm sorry, to provide value to people that no one else can provide or provide it in a way that's better than everybody else, and you'll win every single time. Every yep. single time. You will win if you're providing value to other people. So your entire mindset constantly needs to be, how am I bringing value to these people, not to me? And I mean everywhere in life. Like I see idiots fuck this up all the time. Even when it comes to dating, dudes don't get this, right? They think it's about them. The guys who are really good, the players, they understand that if I want this girl to see how I bring value to her. Now, they may not live up to it when they start dating. That's a different conversation. But they understand that if this woman sees the value I bring to her, I'm going to win. But dudes don't get that. They, they miss it. So it does it, a job. You want to get hired? They got to see that you bring more value to them as measured by how they measure value than every other candidate. You want to win a deal? They got to see you bring more value to them than every other competitor. People don't get this. We're so narcissistic. We're so self-centered. They don't get it. It's not about you. It's about the buyer, the decision per person, the person is the seat of making the choice. And they got to see that you bring more value than anybody else. And that's how you make money. I, I, I have to imagine there, there's people that listen to this, to this podcast, Keenan, and most people I bet would, would kind of pigeonhole you guys into the quota carrying mid-market enterprise team. Like, Hey, we're going to teach these, these folks how to, do a much better job of qualifying and managing deals. I think the message needs to be heard by enablement and by the early stage, the early stage people, because here's what happens today. And I see it at our customers a lot. A kid comes in and for a week, what do they learn about Keenan? They learn about their product. They learn about their message. They learn about their unique value prop, but in the, in the context of them, nobody, yep. You go, you're going in to sell the IT administrators and if you're a 23 year old kid, you don't even know what that job is about and they never nope. teach you what it is. Nope. You're nailing it's, it. It's, it's broken. It's broken. The whole thing is broken. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and one point I want to make because it's important. Um, cause, I, cause you, you said like the step is why aren't you here today? Right? Like that's what, what is the problem? Nobody is going to call their baby ugly. So you, that's where the execution comes in is like, really, like I, I had a boss, you'll love this. I had a boss that taught me when I go into a meeting, when I was at a reseller, he's like, sit, he's like, don't sit on the opposite side of the table, sit on the same side as the customer. And that needs to be your mental mindset too. You need to sit with them and you need to figure out what the hell's, what the hell's going on, JR. And the first time you ask him what the hell's going on. You need to keep digging because they're, you're never going to get to the core of the problem until you're like five or six, seven, eight questions in and you really understand what's going on. Yep. Yep. 100%. You nailed it. I love it. I love it. Um, what, uh, I guess, Keenan, I've, I've taken enough of your time, buddy. We're at, we're no, at you're good. Minutes. You're good. Um, our, our audience, like I said, it's, it's, it's folks that play sports at a really high level. We work with all the big players associations, about 60 universities and athletic departments, and we work with a lot of veteran organizations. What, what would your message to that, that audience be of, of human being that is kind of at this point where they're, they're trying to figure out what's next and apply themselves to? How, how would you want them to start thinking about a career in sales and, and why it might be a great path for them? I don't know that it would be a great path for them. So generally speaking, anybody that's got to the, the D1 college level, the Olympic level, 
I guess those are the ones you deal with. If you do have ex-athletes too, for the professional level, what isn't talked about enough, and for most of them, I'm sure there's some in there, you know, there's a, there's a dude I'm thinking about, his name will come to me in a minute. Um, but for the most part, all of them were successful, not because they were good, not because of how hard they worked, not because of their commitment, but it's because they genuinely fucking loved what they did. You don't, you don't get that good at anything and put in the hours if you don't like it. It's just, again, there are a few exceptions. I'm trying to think of that quarterback that got drafted by the Raiders. His dad basically structured his entire life, and then he was drafted in the first round, and then he never played, like, again. It begins with an M, but anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. But, um, look, there's always a few exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, I have a daughter who is who is legitimately on a path to make the U.S. Olympic mogul team. Uh, she's one of the best in the country, and she's only 13 years old. She regularly already beats, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old girls in competitions. She's got a ways to go, but, I mean, you just you just plot it out. And even when I say it, most people even think I'm an asshole, but they, I can't argue with you, right? And I watch her. And she gets tired and doesn't want to go some days. And she doesn't want to do certain things, even at 13. She's already questioning the idea that, Dad, all my friends are out having fun all summer and I'm at fucking ski camp. She's like, don't go. She, no, no, I got to go. Right? So she, like, there are down times. And in the moment, this thing she doesn't like it. But she fucking loves it. She she took second in, in all ages last weekend in um, duels and took third overall is the only kid in the F-15 category to finish in the top 10, never mind on the podium. And she couldn't stop talking about it. Like, she was so excited because she fucking loves it. So why am I saying all this? To answer your question, if you love sales or love interacting with people or love solving problems, and this might be for you, but if it's not, don't do it. Like, the one piece of advice is go find something you're going to love to do every day because it's the only way you can get good at it. I love sales. I love problem solving. I love engaging people. I love challenging people. Like, so everything that sales is about is what I get excited about. And I even do it when I'm not working. Some knucklehead called me the other day to sell me shit. And I had to spend 20 minutes coaching because it was so bad. I love to do that. Right? So that's the long answer. I can't tell you to get into sales, but I can tell you as you start digging into it, do you fucking love it? And if you do, then lean in. If you don't go find something else. Yeah. By the way, uh, you're talking about Todd Mar Maranovich. Uh, yes. Him. Yes. Thank you. Todd Maranovich. I knew it'd be with an M. I kept confusing him with the, the first round pick from, uh, from Wisconsin who, um, I mean, to the Green Bay Packers who did all the steroids. It was the lineman. He has a name that ends with M too. And I, I was confusing yeah, yeah, the two. Yeah. But anyways, yes. Todd Maranovich didn't do shit. Yeah. Hated it. But his dad made him do it. Yeah, they called him the test tube QB. That's what they called him. Yes, um, yes. See, yes. That's yes. There you go. But they're few and far between. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think like, so I agree with you. But I but I also I also think about like, I, listen, dude, I sold VMware licenses and EMC storage. I love sales. It's, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. I was I didn't own a computer in college. I was a sociology major with a minor in art history and sign language. As I got better at it, I fell more in love with it. Same thing with hockey. And before I played Division One hockey, when I was little, I, I loved it. It was in my bones. My dad's a high school hockey coach. But over time, as I worked at it and got better, you can you. I always tell people you don't necessarily follow your passion. Sometimes you got to work for your passion a little bit. And there, to your point about like your daughter and the shit that she hates doing. There's always no matter what you do, there's going to be shit that you hate doing but you've got to go and find the things of joy, right? So helping people, those things are super important. Having empathy, wanting to solve problems, but there's also aspects of sales from an athlete perspective that are going to give you joy. There is a scoreboard. There is a depth chart, right? You are on a team. Sales is a team sport, whether, you know, the people on LinkedIn that took this company from zero to this want to admit it. It ain't just them. It's, it's, you're going to work with a large organization and you got to work with customers. So we try to find those like environmental parallels and explain to them like, hey, you can't play football anymore, but you can still get X, Y, and Z. You can still get the competition. You can still get the teamwork, the camaraderie, and you can get the glory when you get to this certain point in your career and you start being the one that rings the bell. You know what I mean? So I'll answer your question again, and I'll answer this way. If <laughs> the 
those are the things that get you jazzed. Yes. That are more athletic, athletic specific as opposed to swimming specific, football specific. You know what I'm saying? Like if 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 it's the competition that is what is a main factor in your success as an athlete, then yeah, I think sales might be good for you. But again, I I, I just I don't subscribe to the idea that that any person should be in anything because yeah. you got to and, and I also I, I yes look the the dragon lady or the dragon mom this goes back to but there was a woman called the dragon mom who made Wall Street Journal the New York Times how she raised her kid and people hated her for it. she wouldn't let her do sleepovers and made her practice the piano and blah 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 and one of the things she said that really stuck with me and and it kind of worked with the raising my own kids is she says at least with kids. People don't normally like things until they're good at them. So you really can't, you can't decide if you like it or not until you're good at it. So she made her kid get really, really good at the piano. And now this is my piece. And then she said, if you want to quit now that you're really good, you can quit. But the kid was really good at it. So now they don't want to quit. But if they didn't quit, it means they fucking hated it. So let them go. You know what I'm saying? Um, So there's this, I agree with you. There's that piece of this. But I I, I believe there's also a piece that says inherently, am I going to get, how how difficult or painful is it going to be to get through that part? Because I don't love it. Like, I think if I was a good guitar player, a piano player, I'd fucking love it and keep going. But my personality yeah. is such that I don't like what it would take to get there. So if you ask me to start a job where I had to learn to play the guitar or learn to play the piano, and same thing with language, the first year or two are going to be fucking hell. And I'm probably not going to make it. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? I'm just, yeah. it's just, yeah. So that's what I'm looking for is that overlap between liking yeah. it enough to get through getting good at it and then being great at it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I- so I, I've actually never, uh, I've never been able to communicate why I think our business is successful, but I actually think you just hit the nail on the head because the only thing you have for the first 12 months, if you're like a BDR and all you do is cold call, the only thing you have is the fact that you're on a team and you're competing. Yep. You don't get to really help people solve problems. Nope. You don't get to really have empathy. You literally have a scoreboard of activity and productivity, and that's what you're playing for. Yep. So that if that can serve you enough through that year where you're learning how to do all the yep. same stuff you're doing and then you become good and become an AE, but you're absolutely right, dude. I always tell people life is too short. You're going to spend 33% of it working. Do not fucking do something that you hate. Do not yep. do something that doesn't make you jump out of bed in the morning. So that's, yep. that's the nugget right there. So, so I, I will agree with you 1000% because as I look back on my own career, look, we didn't have SDRs and that we were full service. I had what got, what motivated me to get up every morning was the competition. So yeah, that's a great point. I didn't think shit about it. I mean, I told you at the beginning of this call, I knew it was about helping people, but what drove me every day was I was going to sell more than the person next to me. Fuck you. I had to shoot chip on my shoulder. What do you mean you hired someone else with me? Cause you didn't think I was going to make it. I'll show you. So it was all about the competition. That's all I cared about. That's why I loved it. Then when I got really good at it then I realized, Oh, I like more than the comp- comp- competitive pieces, a whole bunch, but yeah, that's a good point. It's about competition. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was a, I'm, I'm the oldest of three boys, Keenan. We all played Division One hockey, but my middle brother played in the NHL and played in the Olympics. So, like, I've been I've been trying to compete against this little yeah. motherfucker my entire life. Yeah. So, like, that shit is in my bones. I, I, yeah. I, I wasn't even the best hockey player in my own house growing up. So, I can really- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the competition. I got that 100%. I love it. I love it. Keenan, this has been awesome, dude. Thank you so much for the time, man. We really appreciate it. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.